What's up, guys? It's Friday, June 18th, 2021. And on this edition of the Fritz Cast, I bring on Justin O'Donnell. Justin O'Donnell is a great libertarian activist, former candidate, former LNC uh, member, board member. And uh, I brought him on board to talk about what has happened with the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. Now, if you don't know what happened, I'm going to give you a really sucky breakdown right now, like a very, very small condensed version that uh, the, the the somebody went rogue and there was the seizing of assets and uh, expulsion of membership and all that. It's kind of coming... It's kind of us. The dust is kind of settling. Things, some wrongs are being righted, but there's still a lot to unpack with it. And Justin, being in New Hampshire, being such an activist, has a good mind and a good brain to pick on this kind of thing. And that's why I invited him onto the show. And let you know, let's face it. I'm not the smartest dude. I'm I'm really not. I question your sanity for watching my show or listening to my show. For those of you who listen to my show. I question y'all sanity, um, day in and day out. It's number one thing on my mind. I'm very concerned that you would come to me for anything. But uh, he he came on the show. Great discussion. Um, practically an hour long of just his backstory, his history, how he got into libertarianism. Working in um, the the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire, uh, running as a candidate unpacking this madness that's happened over this past week uh, because it's been tyrannical, to say the least. So, rather than ramble and rant and rave about it and just go off and try to make myself look smart because I'm not <laughs> on this stuff, let's just, let's just go to the interview with Justin O'Donnell on FritzCast right here, right now. Justin O'Donnell, welcome to the FritzCast, my friend. How are you? I'm great, Fritz. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, I scheduled this with you uh, with this big fiasco in uh, New Hampshire going on, and uh, we're going to dive into the thick of this because uh, some things have just been updated within the last couple of hours that uh, kind of changed the game a little bit, but not, not really in my book. But uh, before we do anything, let's start with... Who are you, and and uh, and what have you done within the Libertarian Party? You can even go into how you became a Libertarian. Crash course me for for a minute on Justin O'Donnell. Well, the how I became a Libertarian one that's a bit of a longer story, um, involving serving in the military and being the non commissioned officer in charge of what I consider to be a terrorist operation. Now, when I look back, when we I was in the Massachusetts National Guard and we occupied the city of Boston, denying people of their rights, not once, but twice within a four month period. Um, and long story short, after the Boston Marathon bombing, I remember the big security operation on July 4th, 2013. Uh, at one point I'm walking with my Lieutenant between checkpoints to make sure our guys were fed and had water. And it was a hundred something degrees outside, really miserable day. Uh, millions of people in Boston trying to watch the fireworks and somebody plopped down in the yard uh, in a chair on the sidewalk in front of us cracked open a book and started reading lieutenant said he was going to arrest him so you got to move you're blocking traffic this I looked down and I see the guys reading 1984 and I just burst into tears laughing um, and as my <laughs> lieutenant asked me what's so funny I have to explain to a college-educated second lieutenant in the United States Army, the plot of 1984. And as I'm explaining the plot to 1984 to this lieutenant, I'm coming to the realization, I'm like, ah, oh, man, we're the bad guys. Oh, shit. <laughs> like, so at that point was when I decided not to re-enlist uh, and did my career in the military and went on to pursue other things using, I had a college degree in emergency management and homeland security. I uh, ended up going to work in the more on the business continuity and consulting side of things rather than working for the government still. Um, in, in 2016 was the first year I really got involved with the Libertarian Party and uh, for the Gary Johnson campaign. And I helped 
work on the ballot access committee for the Gary Johnson campaign, uh, helping run the petition drives in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to make sure he got on the ballot in all 50 states. And uh, here we are five years later, I say I'm one of the more radical libertarians. It's weird because I came in with the most pragmatic ticket that ever existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Gary was my introduction to the Libertarian Party, but not really my introduction to libertarianism. After that rabbit hole I went down in 2013 after the marathon bombing and 4th of July security uh, mission, uh, I ended up listening to a lot of Julie Borowski, um, Rand Paul, and we're following the Liberty Republican side of things. Um, but in 2016 with Trump is when I finally jumped ship to come to the Libertarian Party. Um, long story short, not that much longer I, later, I was actually elected to the LNC. I served two terms on the LNC as the Region 8 representative, uh, representing all of New England, New York, and New Jersey. Um, since I've moved to New Hampshire in 2017, I've run for U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate uh, as the top ballot access candidate in the state. And uh, I've never had an official leadership position within the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire, uh, but I have spent most of my free time in New Hampshire, um, traveling the state, meeting with voters, meeting with p media uh, people. Uh, I've done televised interviews in New Hampshire about libertarianism, about the Libertarian Party. Uh, I've given speeches uh, at the New Hampshire State House about marijuana legalization, gun rights, and gay marriage, all in the same day. Um, so <laughs> so um, it, it, nowadays, I have stepped back. Last year, I chose not to run for a third term on the Libertarian National Committee. Um, I was replaced by Tucker Coburn of New York, who just resigned this morning. So that's uh, huh. part of the drama going on. Yeah. Um, but lately, I've been just working in the nonprofit sector. Um, I've been trying to help spearhead a new nonprofit here in New Hampshire called Emergent Order, where we are working to kind of like embolden and embrace the idea that the politics is downstream from culture and if we really want to make a difference in libertarian politics long term we need to build a libertarian culture short term which means outside the system activism community centers pot likes cop blocking um teaching people their filming rights um photography of police officers uh surveillance of the state not by the state uh, that kind of stuff and we're focusing on the community side of things where we're fundraising right now to uh save a community center that has existed a long time and is at risk and then start expanding by opening a new series of community centers not just in new hampshire but across the country that are focused on free market and agorist principles and are going to use libertarian ideals to serve their community no i, I dig that i dig the education aspect and the reason why is because i kind of share in your backstory coming into libertarianism, it was G Gary Johnson was that entryway. And it's very weird when you're, when you're somebody that stepped into the philosophy from Gary Johnson, when you're, uh, when you hear all these people talk about Ron Paul and uh, some, some of them even going back as far as like Harry Brown, uh, who right. I call the, I call them the OGs of the libertarian <laughs> party. Uh, I think the education aspect so, so big and so often not focused on, because uh, I remember diving in with with Gary Johnson and thinking this is you know this is a good choice you know this is uh, th this guy gets it, and then I look back at it now and I'm like wow what was I thinking man <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I remember just the clips of him on the news doing stupid stuff like you know sticking his tongue out and and of course what is Aleppo but but that's beside the point. And the crazy thing is like. 2016 wasn't when I first became aware of the Libertarian Party. It's when I first got involved in them. Um, I grew up in an incredibly politically involved household. Um, my mother was running, ran for local office every election when we lived in Massachusetts. Um, we were, my mother is an old guard in the New Hampshire, in the Massachusetts Republican Party, uh, which is actually a thing that people don't know exists. <laughs> and... <laughs> I remember Gary Johnson in 2012 when he ran against Mitt Romney when I was out door knocking for Mitt Romney and working campaigning for Mitt Romney. Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of people forget about <laughs> him on the Republican debate stage. Towards the end of the uh, 2016 campaign cycle, I was having a fit and like a breakdown. And I'm like, God damn it. Why the fuck couldn't we have run Gary Johnson 2012 in 2016? 
Yeah. It was such a different candidate. And I remember looking at somebody who worked against Gary Johnson in 2012, how much better of a candidate he was then than he was in 2016. And I don't know what the difference was there and what happened, but it, he was still one of the biggest recruiting lightning rods the Libertarian Party's ever had in 2016. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. imagine how much better it could have been. <laughs> That's that's the thing, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm like, how, how well did it translate? And it just doesn't seem like it translated very well. You know, I, I feel like uh, I, I don't know your thoughts on this past election cycle with, uh, you know, Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen, um, where I ended up. I love Spike Cohen. I, like Spike can talk his can talk his head off on any subject and I'll be right there radically listening to him and and digging it whereas i just think joe's like you know oh she's a nice woman but that's about it <laughs> joe joe is, is she's the one you're calling the old guard the ogs of the liberty movement like this isn't her first run this isn't her first like time having her name on all 50 state ballots um yeah. she she was harry brown's vice presidential candidate um she is kind of dry as a speaker she is kind of unexciting as a candidate um but she's an incredibly principled libertarian uh, and I have no regrets about voting for her. You are right yeah. though. I yeah. do think had spike been the ticket and had been a ticket in the campaign built around spike, it would have had so much more energy and excitement around it um, that it would have been something like I, I, I would have been excited to be working for instead of okay working for. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way to put it because at the end of this last cycle i felt only okay with you know what i had done and it it's amazing because a couple of weeks ago spike was here in delaware speaking at a at an event and our libertarian convention and uh again like he's not running for anything he's not you know he's just there talking but i love it and i want more of it so he's not admitting to running for anything yeah uh, he doesn't know that's he fair. doesn't know <laughs> that's fair his wife fair. hasn't agreed to let him run yet <laughs> Tasha pulls the strings on that one. So, well, if you let if you let some other people uh, think Caitlin Clevin pulls the strings on it, Spike just goes along with it, and Tasha doesn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and it sounds like it sounds like as you dived in with your activism that you just like feet first, you know, full plunge, and uh, and that's great. I think that's cool. I actually think it's indicative of a small bit of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I've had this realization before and I've had the discussion with people. It was less than a year from when I joined the Libertarian Party that I was a member of a board of, that's National Board of Directors. Yeah, it's a little crazy. <laughs> uh, because people, there's a problem in the Libertarian Party of you give the job to the people who show up and you just automatically reward the people who you've seen do the work. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily always a recipe for an improvement. I like to think that I was a net positive to the Libertarian National Committee and that the work I did helped grow the party overall and helped with the party's mission in the two terms that I was on the committee. But like in hindsight, I look back on it. I'm like, I was, there was no way I should have been the next one in line after Larry Sharp for that job. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> like, I, I couldn't imagine filling that, that spot. Right. Um, and, and when I ran, it was like a half-hearted, like, ah, hmm. I shoot Larry Sharp a text message. I'm like, should I run for this? He's like, yeah, you should. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. When I won, I text Karen Ann Harless. I'm like, I guess I'm on the LNC now. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. Damn it. Yeah. Like, oops. Like, that's a thing. Um, no, it, it was a mixed bag. Two terms on the LNC. There, there were some times that I really enjoyed um where the work we got to do and what we engaged in was incredibly meaningful and i understood the purpose and the drive behind what we were doing and the people i got to work with were incredible but there were times where it was like holy fuck i want to <laughs> strangle everyone at this table where's the including rope including my friends yeah like yeah i can imagine that uh, that it is just especially especially if it's your first time going into something like that like, I can't even imagine, like, I, I started attending, you know, meetings and, and I get Robert's rules of orders thrown at me and I'm like, what the fuck is this? 
Well, this is, that's the thing. It's like when Larry Sharp resigned from the LNC, he was the Region 8 alternate. I thought I was running for the alternate seat. I'm like, all oh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and learn. Cool. I get elected, and the next day, Patrick McKnight resigns. He was just waiting till there was an alternate to replace him. And yeah. so all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm at the table. The very first motion, like the day I am, a, I am made the Region 8 representative, there is a motion on the table to suspend the vice chair of the party. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. so I, I got dumped into one of the most controversial things that had ever been a decision for the board. Yeah. Until now. Well, yeah. Then, um, <laughs> speaking of now, uh, you know, I guess we might as well just dive into it. Uh, let me let me preface this by saying, when uh, Joseph Bis- Bishop Henchman uh, won LNC chair, I was like, all right, I don't really know this dude. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go on a net positive. It's not Nick anymore, so this this has got to be a good thing. And now I'm like these last couple of days i've been like oh shit you know this isn't um this isn't any better in fact it might even be worse (laughs) so i mean before getting into the it's not nick anymore i'm going to preface by saying nick sarwark served three terms on the lnc Mm -hmm. his first two terms as chair he was the best chair this party has ever had yeah his third term as chair he was the now second worst chair this party has ever had. Wow. <laughs> and it, it blows my, the difference there. I don't know what happened to him. Something went on with Nick. Something went on with his motivations in his family life. But he was a different, he, he was different in his third term than he was the first two terms. In the first two terms, he was handedly the best chair this party had ever had. And in his third term, he just decided to take things in a different direction. Yeah, no, I, I will I will echo that sentiment because as I was getting in in 2012 and 2016, I had a lot of respect for Nick. I did, I, you know, hands down. And I loved the work that he did. And then overnight, it's like a, a, the switch got flipped and I'm like, who the hell are you? Like, th- this is not you. This is not productive. This is not, you know, it, it, so, somewhat I felt, feel like it became about him almost. Like it, it, it was just, you know, an ego thing, but I'm not entirely sure. And I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pin it on any one thing, but well, I've, I've publicly called him a narcissist. Um, and yeah. Not just like publicly in regards to LP stuff. Uh, if I turn, if I pointed my camera out the window, I could show you his house. He's literally across the street and two doors down from me um so yeah. like it, it, it's it's within our community it's become problematic and how he treats people and how he engages with people and he's really ostracized a large part of the liberty community in new hampshire um the no to vote that happened at our convention when he ran for treasurer yeah uh, he likes to chalk it up to the mises kids who just don't like him no the mises kids came with about 45 percent of the delegates they weren't quite a majority um they were a sizable portion but two-thirds of the convention voted none of the above yeah like it was a lot of the old guard and a lot of his old friends that voted for noda instead of him yeah some people just get tired of the uh tired of the shit yeah um including at least somebody has reported to me who claims to know that Gillette jarvis voted none of the above for that vote <laughs> oh boy here we go <laughs> all right so what <sighs> What the hell happened in New Hampshire? I mean, this this kind of buzzed up overnight. Like, I, I just started looking on my Twitter feed, and I was like, what the hell is going on? Everybody's talking about New Hampshire. Uh, this was a long time coming. Um, the, writing on the, the writing has been on the wall for this since the day Joe Jorgensen came to New Hampshire to file her paperwork for presidential run uh the week after the convention the week after the nominating convention we had the was the filing deadline in new hampshire um the night after the night of the convention i was on the phone with Stuart flood and steve dasbach on uh the joe joe jorgensen campaign arranging the details I'm like all right we need to get joe in new hampshire as soon as possible like we need to take advantage of this is the first filing deadline in the country she's got to do it in person we're going to make a show of it and launch the campaign the right way um and she did we did a it's where things started to fall apart with the campaign, in my, my opinion, too. They had agreed to do it. They'd set the date. And that was the last I'd heard of it until about th- three days before she landed. No further communication. And then I get an email from an, uh, somebody on her campaign saying, do you have somebody who can drive her? 
I'm like, you don't have that arranged? They're like, oh, we thought Daryl Perry was going to do it, but he can't drive. I'm like, Daryl Perry was the only one they had talked to, and they had arranged her entire itinerary for New Hampshire with Daryl Perry. The itinerary consisted of filing and one interview with, the, with Free Talk Live. That was her itinerary when she got to New Hampshire. I looked at it. I emailed back Carla Howell. I'm like, this isn't happening. I am taking over. I have some, yep. Uh, I have Mo. She, Mo's going to go pick up Joe at the airport. Mo's going to bring her to the hotel. I've got the filing. Fuck, we're going to get to the state house an hour before the, they open for the filing. And I've got reporters from WMUR and CBS who are going to meet us there and do interviews on the spot. We're going to do her televised interviews at the state house. Uh, yeah, I've got four newspaper uh, reporters who are going to be at the filing who want to do interviews with their there. Okay, LRN, we're not driving an hour and a half out to Keene from Concord. She can re- we'll call, she can call in and do that interview. Uh, we have a meet and greet dinner. We did a big event at Murphy's Tap Room in Manchester. Almost eighty people came out to meet her that night and dinner. I bought her lobster. She bought she ordered a lobster lobster dinner on my tab, and I wasn't even upset. That's how much I like Joe Jorgensen. Right. <laughs> um, after that, there's a Black Lives Matter vigil downtown because that was what was going on then. That was in the midst of all the riots and the Black Lives Matter hoopla. I'm like, we're going to go to that. And we're going to have Joe, like, not speak. We're going to have Joe photographed and recognized, shown up, not speaking. Um, and she had an amazing public statement about how it was important for candidates running for office to be at these events not to be seen as people trying to lead but as people trying to understand the plight of the communities they're seeking to represent and i thought it was amazing and it really set the campaign off on a great foot but then the moment she left the next morning internally in new hampshire things went to shit nick sarwark leslie ann peterson the left kind of side of the party started publicly shaming people and throwing fits about the fact that half of us showed up to the rally not wearing masks. Yeah. Um, I, I had people condemning me on Facebook. I got death threats from non-party members, but like who I had mutual friends with that included Nick Sarwark and Leslie Ann Peterson saying that I was awful for not wearing a mask because there was a picture that went viral of me, Joe, Nick Sarwark, and Richard Manzo. Like it had tens of thousands of shares on Facebook um, where me and Joe were not wearing masks. Nick and Manzo were wearing masks. And people lost their minds because I wasn't wearing a mask, but I was open carrying a gun. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, wow. And so it just got incredible uh, pushback. And that started really the division in LPNH, not on any form of political lines, on COVID lines, on where people felt about masks and lockdowns and, um, what, and the social distancing requirements and what was going on. Um, where but I'd mentioned my community center project. We have a community center in New Hampshire. It's called The Quill. Um, it's the Fraternal Order of Porcupines. It's the Fraternal Order Lodge. Uh, it's nicknamed the Quill, Porcupine Quills. And we host, we, during the lockdown, when everything was closed, nothing was going on, we were hosting weekly potluck dinners yeah. where we invited everyone in the community. It's like, we don't give a fuck about the lockdown. Like, it's more important that we have a community to rely on uh, and that people have friends and family that they can turn to in a time of crisis uh, than it is that you don't get a flu. It's more important is what was our belief. And so we made sure we violated the law. We broke the lockdown protocols. We kept the club open and we had these, we had 60, 70 people every Friday night showing up for these community potlucks. And our community grew as people who weren't libertarians before the lockdowns started coming to our events and started joining our community and learning more about libertarianism. But a lot of the old guard people we'd considered die hard, like died in the wool libertarians were so scared of COVID that they started, they stopped associating with those who weren't. They stopped coming out to the uh, potlucks. They stopped going to the rallies. Their activism stopped. They hid in their homes behind their computers and door dashed every meal and tweeted and Facebooked about how awful everybody who was doing anything else was. And unfortunately, they were tweeting and Facebooking that from the blue check marked official accounts of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. Oh, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> and when they were doing that it pissed people off 
uh, because people who self-identified as libertarians who really believe in the community and cultural values of libertarianism and how it affects their lives, not just their politics, saw the libertarian party attacking them and took offense to it. Um, and that was the real big spurn when their Mises caucus started recruiting hand over fist. Um, people I've known for years, but who've never been involved politically are suddenly buying lifetime memberships because they want to get involved and take back the branding of what it means to them. Um, and as they're getting involved, as they're saying, hey, new to the party, really want to get involved, what can I help? You have people in the comment section, you can't, you're a racist piece of shit. What? Excuse me? How am I racist? You're in the Mises caucus. Yeah. That that was the extent of it. Um, so, like, the blowback, like, this was blowback. This was, this was... This was the result of blowback where at our convention, three of the six seats were taken by the Mises caucus uh, for the EC. Um, and the other three seats were taken by moderates, middle of the road people who were trying to remain friends with everybody. AJ Olding, Stephen Nass, and Gilletta Jarvis were not in the Mises caucus. Um, hell, Gilletta was elected unanimously. The Mises caucus whipped for her. She was their yeah. candidate. They did. They chose not to run someone against her because to find someone that they could prop up against her wasn't worth it when she had had such a strong history of activism in the party that they respected. They didn't want to run anyone against her. So in hindsight, the whole split and the schism and kicking everyone out, she stabbed them in the back after they went to bat for her with their own group. Uh, is what it felt like and i don't think we're done with the blowback yet i i think the 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 blowback of mises taking over led to the blowback of the prags trying to steal it back and it's just gonna be another big push of blowbacks um there's already people talking about bylaws amendments to actually put in place a mechanism to kick people out of the party and there's already a list of people to be kicked out who've been involved in the little schism um so that's pretty that's pretty crazy in my mind that the libertarian party that that there's people in the libertarian party who are now drafting bylaws to just expel entire swaths of members like on votes and and shit like that that that's just a little nutty to me i mean at least they're trying to draft the bylaws to do it instead of just announcing that it was done <laughs> instead like, of just doing it <laughs> right uh and, and that was the biggest problem is Gilletta jarvis uh, made this announcement out of the blue i had talked to her the night prior to her announcement um about working with jeremy kaufman on improving messaging and toning down the twitter and taking things back from the edge and like getting back on message and back focused. And she seemed really positive about that interaction when I told her that it wasn't just me. It was also Dave Smith and Angela McArdle and Michael Heiss who are all trying to get Jeremy Kaufman to tone it the fuck down. Um, and, and so rather than waiting a couple more hours to see the prog the result of that, she, boom. Mind you, we're at a barbecue. Again, like I said, we never stopped hosting events throughout COVID, never, because community matters more than the law. Absolutely. Um, myself and AJ Olding were hosting a barbecue for libertarians in Manchester. Uh, we had almost 100 people show up. It was an amazing day. Uh, almost all of the Mises Caucus guys showed up. About half the Libertarian Party membership showed up at one point. Um, and at one point, I'm sitting there, like, tending the fire in my smoker, getting enough to temperature before we put a brisket and some ribs on the racks and get a text message saying, and my like, aj watch this fire i gotta go call the lnc and i went inside and called the entire lnc and screamed at them one by one yeah about what the fuck just happened um the only one who didn't get back to me was joe bishop henchman who ah. took who took a day and a half to get back to me to say i'm not getting involved i'm like you're already involved yeah. like she, she, she's using this letter you gave her as the justification for everything she did insanity man it's insanity so she pulls this move in which she this was pretty much her unilaterally disenfranchising people right 
So that's where it was really confused. We didn't really know what was going on at first. She posted from the LP and Age website that everybody was gone. No, no more members. And if you wanted to rejoin, you had to sign her pledge and whatnot and agree to her new bylaws that came out of nowhere and weren't like they're, they were awful. Like they were some, one of the most tyrannical sets of bylaws I'd ever read. Uh, they included giving herself a four year unelected term. Um, but then Joe Bishop Henschman's email came out in which he said um, that the entire board had constructively resigned. And so per like some obscure notion in Roberts as the chair being the only remaining member of the board, she could fill the vacancies, blah, da, 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 da. And that this was all by the book and she could do it. And I'm sitting there reading Joe Bishop Henschman's email like this is bullshit, but he's saying she gave him prior warning that he knew she was going to do this. Um, and then that night, Karen Ann Harless did her interviews. I was I joined the Mises Caucus group for their interview with Karen Ann Harless. I had a lot to say on that. I was not happy. Um, but the next morning after that, I watched Gilletta's interview with Karen Ann, where Gilletta said the exact opposite of what JVH had said, that no, she didn't fire anybody. Everyone was still on the board, that she had started a new party and was using Joe's letter as evidence that she was the affiliate and we were just some random party. That is some crazy shit. <laughs> right. And, and it was at that point I realized after watching Karen Ann's interview with Gilletta, um, that was when I realized I'm like one of them's lying, one of them's being manipulated, both of them are doing corrupt as hell shit. I don't know which one's being lying to and which one's being manipulated, but at this point, they're both engaging in utter corruption and professional malfeasance. Um, and that's when I decided to just go to war with the LNC. Um, turns out, when I decided I was going to go to war with the LNC over this, I got the EC of the, the legitimate EC of the party um, riled up, started contacting LNC members. Turns out, the LNC was on our side for the most part. They were pissed. Karen Ann, um, Josh Smith, Stephen Nicola, uh, like the bulk of the LNC was livid about how things happened and pissed about the way things were going. Uh, and in the past week, it's just unveiled more and more corruption um, and splintering with even, even within the LNC that we weren't aware was there. Yeah, it's been crazy, and, and uh, major. I give major props to uh, to Karen Ann for what she has uh, been putting out on her YouTube channel over this stuff because she she's been working seemingly nonstop over this stuff. Yep, and and trying to duly inform everybody of what's going on, and I appreciate that, even though so many people just want to. It's it's a shit show. Everybody wants to shit on her. Everybody wants to shit on you know this person or that person this faction or this group and it's it's nuts it's nuts to be it, it's always been nuts to be a libertarian but right now it's especially nuts to be a libertarian right um i i, I i've been trying to find the light and the humor and all of this as we've been going and like maybe like like every every turn every every few hours i'd like okay where's the positive spin how 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 is this a good thing how is this a positive thing um at one point i'm like well growing pains means that we're growing Right, right. So, so, I mean, it was bound to have these kind of problems at some point in our history. It's good that we're going through them now instead of when we have a like legitimate presidential race going on that we end up torpedoing because of it. Um, so yeah. it's good that we're working this shit out now. Um, and then at one point, like when I was in a Twitter thread describing the list of assets uh, that were stolen, um, people, somebody had asked, like, what other than, like, social media and websites was stolen and we started listing the contents of the storage locker and the physical assets of the party that were stolen and the one of the responses i got was like the most surprising part of all of this is that the libertarian party has assets <laughs> 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 and that like at that point i'm like you're actually you're right yeah no the the big public perception of the libertarian party right now is that it's it's nothing um, the fact is we've grown to the point where we have things we're worried about getting stolen. Yeah. Um, so, so there is positive spin on this. Like, yeah, the Libertarian Party has grown enough that we have things that are worth stealing. The Libertarian yeah. Party has grown enough that we have things that are worth people engaging in corruption to control. 
Um, so, so that, that is a good sign for the future. And like I said, growing pains does mean we're growing. Yeah, no, I, I can agree with that. And I can, and so assets that were stolen, it was, um, it was websites, social media, mailing systems. Right. But then there was also like video equipment and uh, from my understanding, at least. Or- yeah. The audio video equipment, the tabling setups, the, uh, we had a storage locker. It was about a medium sized storage locker, but it was packed like you needed to be a Tetris, like level 99 master to fucking put everything back in there. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Like the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire has been the most successful Libertarian Party affiliate in the country for 50 years. We have the highest per capita membership in the country of any Libertarian Party before any of this. So like, we've always been slightly ahead of the curve as far as like what we're doing for outreach um, and how fast our local party's grown compared to like, say, kansas or south carolina or other states um so over the years we've acquired a lot of stuff including thousands of dollars of audio and video equipment uh pa systems because we host our own events out in the public um as well as our community and social events uh we actually have or had before last week thriving county affiliate programs uh where the county parties would host events um Their excuse was we took it out for the Southern New Hampshire Libertarian Party Convention, one of our affiliate uh, parties. But the venue that that convention was supposed to be at had all the equipment. They didn't need anything for it. Uh, I know the owner of that that venue. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm camping with him next week. <laughs> I'm leaving Saturday. I'm going to see him up there Monday up in the White Mountains. Um, he had the PA system. He has it's like he owns a bar and a restaurant that he was letting us use for the convention, and he had everything we would need. We wouldn't have needed to bring anything. So it's a straight up lie to say they needed it for the convention. Plus about. 80% of stuff in there would have been had nothing to do with convention use. It was like parade materials and door knocking material uh, uh, supplies yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, they cleaned it out barren. There was nothing left in there except one of my yard signs, which wasn't in there to begin with. I keep all my yard signs because my campaigns have never taken money from the party for our materials. I have fundraised and spent out of pocket on all of my campaigns instead of taking money from the party. Um, And so the party wouldn't have had any of my signs as its property. Uh, But at one point, whoever was involved in the theft managed to come across one of my signs because you don't recover 100% of them after a campaign ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, And they left my signs on display in the storage locker. (laughs) As a little That's, fuck you. This is Justin <laughs> O'Donnell's storage locker now. Yeah. Um, so I believe that all that stuff has all been returned now. Uh, okay. Funnily enough, they cut the lock because we went over there. Uh, Stephen S went over there, filed, uh, Stephen and Nolan filed a police report about the stolen assets because they have a fiduciary duty to um, protect the donations of the members of the party that were used to purchase those assets. So they were forced, their hand was forced to file a police report about it. Um, somebody went over to the storage unit, cut the lock, and put it all back. Oh, well, hey, I mean, you got it all <laughs> back, though. They took the, it took a police report and threat of jail time to get it back. Fair um, enough. And as far as the return of the, uh, digital assets the website twitter and facebook social media today that did not come until josh smith put a formal motion into the lnc to start a formal investigation and compel the chair uh to uh turn over all of his communications so they could uh investigate his personal emails to determine who he was actually in touch with and who was involved and then all of a sudden within an hour of that everything's returned yep Yep, I remember because I read Josh's uh I read Josh's tweet about it. Um yeah. he dropped it at four right after four PM Eastern Standard Time. He said within one hour of making a motion for our chair to release all correspondence, the assets are returned. I ain't done yet. And I said <laughs> shouldn't be done yet. So they're fucking caving now, but they still did this shit. No free pass, no bygones hey, be bygones. I, I've had a lot of problems with Josh in the past. Me and Josh did not get along last term uh-huh. when when we were on the lnc together 
Um, I, I, I campaigned against Josh for chair. I don't think he was a good candidate for chair at all. And I'll defend those points backwards a hundred times. Um, I actually whipped for JVH and I worked for, helped campaign for JVH to be chair. Um, believe it or not, like hindsight 2020 here. Um, but I, I have the utmost respect for what Josh has done. Like yeah. for standing up for the libertarian party, standing against corruption and, um, like and again i joined the mises caucus two, two days ago i i've been the anti-caucus guy i i've been the one yep. that campaigns that the caucuses are destroying the party but the pragmatic caucus and their actions they went nuclear i can't fight back against corruption without a nuclear weapon the mises is the only other nuke around yeah so yeah. unfortunately they forced my hand i joined the mises caucus and i'm going to be helping them at this point um because it's more important to me to root out corruption than to like stand idly by and watch people pick sides um yeah. so uh, i'll be diving back in i was hoping to take the two years off and not be involved in politics at like all. it was stressful after two terms on the lnc uh running for the u.s senate it was a uh, stressful like a mental health nightmare i'm like i'm just backing off i'm done <laughs> uh i got a year out of it i got a year being uninvolved and i've been dragged back in at this point um and god i hate politics i especially hate internal politics um but i go back to saying i i like to think i was very influential and made a positive impact during my time on the lnc enough to the point when i woke up this morning and got a text message at 7 a.m to tell me that tucker coburn the regional representative who had replaced me on the lnc had voted to disaffiliate one of his own states and he voted to disaffiliate new hampshire I had decided at 7 a.m. that by end of business today, Tucker would no longer be on the LNC because he, that to me, that crossed a line. That was an endorsement of theft, fraud, and institutionalized corruption. Um, and I had, a, I had built up enough goodwill and respect within the Region 8 states over the past two years that I immediately started texting state chairs and former state chairs um, and vice chairs in the states that I made, that I built such good relationships with. And there was a ballot started by the Connecticut state chair to remove Tucker Coburn from the LNC um, by a 4 a chair majority within an hour of i was still in bed tired as shit i was up till 3 a.m last night 7 a.m i'm sending these texts 9 a.m tucker resigned wow wow so yeah a lot of this stuff is happening at a breakneck speed now yeah um but like i i look back on like i liked tucker up until all of this i thought that kid had a very bright future he's incredibly intelligent very motivated um having the gall to vote to disaffiliate the people you represent to me was a line too far um had he abstained it would have been justifiable um valerie sarwark abstained she didn't vote on the matter because of a conflict of interest of being from new hampshire mm-hmm um, and that would have been the appropriate thing for the regional rep to do. Um, but instead, he chose to actively take sides and support the act of fraud and corruption. And to me, that was a line too far. And I am happy that the goodwill and the relationships I built over my two years on, to, as the LNC rep for this region were still there to the point where the chairs were willing to take my counsel um, and they were willing to act out on my advice. Well, that's no, that's a good thing. And just to, I guess just icing on the cake for it on my drive home this morning, I was listening to some, uh, I was listening to some podcasts and some YouTube catching up on, on the happenings of this. And I, I, the thought came to myself that, you know, you can't sit here and tout that you're the, the party of principle, but then you have this shit show go on. Um, you just, you just can't, it wrecks everything that you stand for. It, right. it, it wrecks the entire purpose. You're supposed to be different than the duopoly. You're different from the Republicans and the Democrats. You don't have this level of corruption about you, except, oh, wait, you do. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, it's. Um, I, I started using the hashtag when I was tweet storming about this because, as you've seen, I've just been nonstop on Twitter. Um, I've had almost a million impressions on my personal Twitter account in the past four days 
Um, That's great. Just how crazy I've been going with it. Um, but it, it seems like the uh, the pragmatic caucus has chosen preference over principle. Yeah, that's <laughs> like all of a sudden the bylaws don't matter and principles don't matter when you disagree with where someone came from because that's what they're saying. They're not disagreeing that these people aren't libertarian. They 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 in a big tent, their big tent libertarian philosophy. People who share eighty percent of libertarian ideals are libertarian. You're welcome to join us. So they cannot make any argument these people aren't libertarian but they came from dave smith and tom woods and ron paul instead of gary johnson and nick sarwark and joe bishop henchman yeah so therefore they're the enemy yeah and 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 i don't i don't understand this i i literally can't wrap my brain around how ron paul is the bad guy how uh how tom woods has become just you know the, the worst thing that you could listen to in libertarianism you know, I don't get it. These are these are all people that helped motivate and boost me in this direction. Absolutely. When you get a chance, you should look at the evidence folder that Gilletta had shared with Karen Ann. Uh, she put it up on a Google Drive for the public to review and for the LNC to review. Um, and it was screenshots of all of her evidence about the Mises takeover and how awful Mises was for the party. Um, and I was patiently waiting for this because at the time I was not a Mises Caucus member. I have been yep. neutral the whole fucking time. I supported Mises Caucus members. I supported non-Mises Caucus members getting elected to the EC. Um, I opened that folder. I read through the evidence. I typed takehumanaction.org and donated money to the Mises Caucus. Yeah. The moment I finished reading the evidence. Mm -hmm. Because one of the pieces of evidence that the Mises Caucus was awful and what they were doing was a screenshot of Sean Dempsey, our at-large EC representative, saying, Ron Paul brought me into the Liberty Movement in 2012. I love Ron Paul. Wow. And that was submitted as evidence to justify why the takeover needed to happen. Damning evidence. That's insane. That's, that's so insane <laughs> to me. And, I, and right. these, are, these are not... These are not just, you know, run of the mill. These are like pillars of libertarian thought. You know, these, these are, these are a lot of, these are guys that have garnered a lot of respect. And that's the only thing that, you know, I, I've been over the last, I would say year, definitely I, I'm a Mises Caucus affiliate, you know, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in on it. Um, so I'm a little bit biased towards it, but, uh, if you ask Michael Heiss and the leadership of Mises Caucus, they'll tell you about how for years, years I was one of their biggest public enemies. Yeah, I, I was one of the ones leading the fight against Mises Caucus because I hated how they were going about things and blah, 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 blah until I started getting actually involved with the New Hampshire Mises Caucus people because they were the ones who actually showed up to help me. Like, yeah. I, I'm running for U.S. Senate. I need help. It's, there's a fucking campaign going on. The only people who showed up were Mises Caucus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like... It's the um, same. It's the same thing here in, in in my state. I got. I decided to take that dive and like you know I'm going to get involved in this. I'm actually going to be an active participant. I'm not just going to be the podcast guy anymore. That you know mm -hmm. sits behind the computer. I'll go out in my community. I'll make these connections. And who's who's the ones that have the motivation? It's the Mises Caucus people. They're they're the ones right. who are saying let's go out and do this. Let's let's put our name out there. Let's let's you know they're coming up with all these different ideas while. You know, people who have been in the party forever are just like, what the hell is up with these guys? Like, and you know, I, I think a lot of the turning point for me was like, at least with the local ones. And I, I even said, like, listen, up, up until I, I, I still maintain, like, I have my problems with how Mises Caucus National Caucus manages their messaging and how they go about running their internal politics. Uh, like, I, there's a lot about it I hate and dislike, but I've gotten to know the local Mises Caucus people in New Hampshire. Not because I've gotten to know them because they started showing up, but because once they started showing up, I realized a lot of them are people who've been my friends for a very long time, who've been very good, close friends in my community, who I had failed to recruit to the Libertarian Party, but the Mises Caucus had succeeded in. Yeah, yeah. Like like Sean Brennan, uh, the new treasurer of LPNH. Um, for five years, we've been unable to get him involved in the Libertarian Party, but Mises yeah. Caucus got him involved. Brandon Brush, one of our uh, newest members, um, myself and AJ Olding have joked, have been trying to recruit him to the Libertarian Party for five years unsuccessfully. Um, Dave Smith got him to join. 
Yeah. Um, Patrick Bender, we've been trying to get to join the party for four years since he moved from California. Like, get involved, Patrick. You're great. Your community outreach is awesome. We want that energy. Nope, nope. Well, nothing to do with politics. Nothing to do with politics. Dave Smith got him to sign up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, it, it wasn't so much that it was just that they were the ones that showed up. It's when they showed up, I realized it was my friends. It was the people who I had grown to care about in my community um, who I already valued and already knew. Um, and they were the ones that Mises Caucus was. So, at, at that point, like, I had to put it aside. I'm like, I'm, I'm willing to work with whoever's willing to work. Nick yeah. Sarwark and Richard Manzo and Leslie and Peterson had proven that they weren't willing to work. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. a sad state of affairs, sad state of affairs. And, and here we are. So the question begs what lies in the future? Because you said, you said it yourself. You, you think the blowback's not done. I'm, I'm sitting here like, yeah, this is just, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg probably, it, you know, with what's going on. So my inside I'm, scoop is that by Friday, there will be a motion um, to the LNC to remove Joe Bishop Benjamin as chair. Okay. Um, I don't think that motion will have three fourths support. It will have a majority, though. Yeah. Uh, I think he will be pressured to resign and he will no longer be on the LNC within a week. Hmm. Um, wow. That's my belief. The, the, the blowback is going all the way back, all the way to the top. Um, I think he's going to resign before letting an investigation happen because he's going to try and protect whoever the third party is that was between him and Gilletta organizing everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're not going to figure out who that third party is because the investigation won't be have access to that. Um, and I think Mises Caucus, this is going to be given the biggest lightning rod for recruitment. They, they got handed the 2022 convention. Yeah. The Mises Caucus was just handed the convention on a golden platter. Um, and again, I know I, I'm one of Mises Caucus's newest members. I still don't think Angela is the greatest candidate in the world for chair. Um, hmm. I think, unfortunately, Joe is an unacceptable alternative now, given what's happened. Yeah. I, I, I wish there were someone better than both of them in the mix. Um, I think Angela is going to win in a landslide after all of this that is yeah. assuming jeremy kaufman gets off of twitter yeah you, you keep bringing up jeremy kaufman's name and i know why i, I get it so uh it, it's it, it really is unfortunate because jeremy kaufman's not even a member of the Mises caucus yeah yeah and a lot um, of people some people don't realize that though Je- Je- uh, no, what nobody realizes is that Gilletta Jarvis had the unilateral authority to remove him from Twitter at any time, and she chose not to do so. Yeah, yeah. But she, but that was the argument for why LPNH had gone bad and needed to be disaffiliated, um, is because of how bad the Twitter was. She had the fucking keys to the Twitter. It was an ad hoc committee, and in the bylaws, the chair could remove a member unilaterally at any time and there were people begging her to do so for weeks and she chose not to act um but not even just members aj olding another ec member had been begging her for weeks to take jeremy off the twitter and she chose to ignore it wow um because she'd been planning this for weeks the whole time and we know that because the evidence that she submitted is all fucking time stamped yeah yeah <laughs> i'm like the emails are there the dates are there we can all see them we're all looking at this <laughs> like like jbh's letter was dated prior to the incident that encouraged jbh's letter like th- this was all information they 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 were planning this for weeks before they pulled the trigger yeah um and I, the blowback is going to be hard it's going to be um it's going to be a big push for the Mises caucus and Again, as a Mises Caucus member now, I will say one of the problems that I've had with Mises Caucus national membership uh, direction is that they are pretty exclusive toward the right in their recruiting. Um, They do bring in a hell of a lot more social conservatives than um, social libertarians. Yeah. Um, And that's not a bad thing. The running prompt that I, I run on is like, what's the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist? six months yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but 
when that is like the prime, that's going to be the super majority of the delegation in Reno, most likely. Mm -hmm. It might set up fights on platform that make us look a little bit too clean to Tea Party 2.0 than true social libertarianism uh, moving forward. And that's something we're going to have to work to defend and work to recover from in the future. Uh, and it's going to be a result of this entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Insanity, man. But you know what? Reno is going to be a fucking blast. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be lit. <laughs> I, I yeah, no. I, I, I'm 100% on board with you. Uh, it, it's going to be, there's some interesting times ahead for sure for, inner party squabbling and the crazy part is that they think they're going to be able to maintain quorum with the convention at a casino <sighs> good luck <laughs> good luck man uh justin i've had you on for almost an hour man um where can i let, let, let's let's uh let's go into wrap-up mode here what's what's the one thing you think that we we libertarians need to do not necessarily you know new hampshire but as a whole what do you think that we need to focus on as we move towards that convention and as we tor work towards figuring out and unpacking everything that's happened and how to move forward from it what, what is the, the one thing the the worst part about libertarian power struggles is how little power people are actually fighting over yeah and i think people need to wrap their heads around that it's like we're, we're a bunch of big fish in a small pond yeah we need to stop fighting over control of the pond and start digging a, a ditch to get us to the lake because yeah. like unless we start growing unless we become a force to be reckoned with unless we start refocusing our efforts on nonpartisan school boards and budget committees and aldermen races what we're not actually doing what we claim to be doing um if people want to be in caucuses i'm going to go back to my old anti-caucus self here make your caucuses issue based and not internal politics based do advocacy groups instead of campaign groups. Like the Mises caucus talks about like, where are the Austrian economics caucus? Okay, I've never heard them talk about Austrian economics, not once. Um, the Prague caucus exists solely as an operations caucus. They don't stand for anything. Um, the radical caucus only cares about being bold and edgy and doesn't care how things get done. That doesn't help either. Um, we need people to come together we need to start looking at the, the unity movement that reed coverdale's been starting that, yep. that's great that's we're getting people across the board to work on the things that actually matter running your local nonpartisan races this is an odd number of year this is city and town election years people are too busy bitching and bickering on twitter why aren't you running for school board why aren't you running for budget committee why aren't you running for selectmen in your town why aren't you taking interest in the representative town meeting in your commonwealth area why aren't you getting involved in your town ballot initiatives there are things to do in off years just because there's no candidate for president doesn't mean that politics stops and we need to focus on doing the things that make a political party a political party and that means building infrastructure building farms recruiting candidates training people bettering ourselves and bettering our uh, mission I'm choosing to do that by focusing on nonprofit and community work that brings libertarianism to a cultural component to grow the movement organically and virally rather than through media and campaigns. But th that's not the only way. That's the way I'm doing it. Um, my GoFundMe is up to almost $140,000 right now in the past two months for that mission because enough people believe in what I'm doing. But it's not the only way. So if you're a libertarian in Pennsylvania, you have your town elections this year, go sign up to run for office. If you're a libertarian in New York, start going to city council meetings and bugging the shit out of your alderman representatives about zoning laws prohibiting the construction of new housing and causing rental costs to go through the roof, which causes a homelessness crisis. If you're a libertarian in a lockdown state, throw a fit about your individual rights being denied in a way that it gets attention. If you're a libertarian in North Dakota that never locked down, that has arguably one of the quote unquote most libertarian governors in the country, hold her to task for using government money to sue herself <laughs> to, to keep yeah. marijuana from being legalized after a ballot initiative. 
If you're a libertarian who, in New England and you don't know what the fuck you're doing, come to Porkfest next week yeah. and meet the rest of your family. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And stop bitching and bickering about who controls a fucking Twitter account. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, Twitter is not as big as people make it out to be. I mean... Unfortunately, it's bigger. I, I actually do agree that Twitter is a huge problem. Um, uh, all politics is local. And here's the thing. LP and H got a lot of blowback for people being really upset about the things Jeremy tweeted from the, uh, the account. God, New Hampshire people loved it. We had like yeah. a, we had like a fifty percent spike in membership, just driven by Twitter engagement and whatnot. People fucking loved it here. Wow. The problem is the message went global. Yeah. The problem is the message went beyond its targeted audience. Yeah. At the same time, I, I hear people talk about like libertarians in like uh, Oregon being really proud about the voluntary masking and voluntary social distancing and blah, 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 COVID fear mongering that their party was putting out on Twitter and that helped them grow where I was being questioned about it and had to answer that nonstop here, but yeah. we didn't call for their disaffiliation over it. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a matter of recognizing that like the problem with Twitter is that it goes too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's <laughs> no boundaries because, because the message that my voters want to hear isn't the message that your voters want to hear, even though they're both libertarian messages. Yeah. And when your voters don't want to hear it, they get upset when I say it and it hurts you. Yeah. Deep, deep, deep way of looking at it, which I'm sure a lot of people, when they hit that send tweet button, they don't actually think about. I mean, I rarely, I mean, send tweet. I'm on Twitter for the endorphin rush. My yeah. main source of serotonin is a fucking little blue bubble on my phone. So right, right, right. <laughs> No, I totally get it, man. Totally get it. Speaking of Twitter and, and your social links, where can people find you on the internet and join you on your quest, my friend? You can follow me on Twitter at O'Donnell4NH. I have not changed that since I ran for Senate. Don't plan to. I like it. It's nice, short, simple, easy to remember. Um, I got a link tree, Cointree. If anybody you aren't familiar with Cointree, if you're a content producer and you're not using Cointree, you're doing it wrong. Cointr.ee allows you to put up all of your links on a blockchain friendly page, including crypto and fiat donation links. Any of my links you want to see my coin tree, it's cointr.ee slash Justin O'Donnell. And there's links, not just to my Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, my merch store, snackswag.com, but also my Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash dash Dogecoin and Ethereum donation links, uh, as well as PayPal and Venmo. That's how people can support our mission. That's how people can support what we're, what we're doing. Um, and if you are a content producer yourself watching this, get on Cointree, blockchain is the future. All right, that's awesome, man. Hey, thanks for, thanks for taking some time out and coming on FritzCast and uh, breaking down New Hampshire for me and, and, and my audience as well, because uh, my God, if I had to do it by myself, I would have, I would have hung myself. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Have a nice night, Fritz.